Hello and welcome to News Click. Today on Talking Science and Tech, we will be discussing this year's Nobel Prize in Physics, and we are joined by Prabir Prakashta. So this year's Nobel Prize has been awarded to Roger Penrose, Andrea Gez, and Reinhard Genzel for their work on black holes. So Prabir, can you first tell us about more about their work, basically, and what they have achieved in their work to be awarded this uh, Nobel Prize? Well, I think there are two separate issues in this uh, in this case. One is that there was a mathematical uh, strategy which Penrose used, and in fact he uh, created some specific uh, mathematics or mathematical methods, what is called the Penrose transform, the topological transforms, to advance the mathematics of black holes or what is now being uh, referred as black holes. Basically, what was called a space-time singularity. Now, that advance that he did was, is one element, of course, of the uh, Nobel Prize. What Getz and Genzel have done is prove that, yes, there is a supermassive object at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. It corresponds to the existence of what a black hole would be like. So there is an experimental confirmation based on data. And that data has been collected for nearly 30 years going back to nearly 30 years. And that shows that the two teams independently working have confirmed the existence of a supermassive object, 4 million uh, suns, solar masses, equivalent to 4 million solar masses at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So these two put together now go to say, yes, that particular object at the center of the Milky Way galaxy is in fact the space-time a singularity, in other words, a black hole. So this is the two things that have happened. As you know, physics uh, has this problem that you may provide a theory, everything may confirm to the theory, but unless you also get a prediction in the theory, which is verified experimentally, physicists have still the doubt, the niggling doubt, maybe this is really not correct. It shows everything, confirms what we know, but does it actually predict things which we don't know? And if there is such a prediction it makes, and we find that the prediction is now uh, confirmed by experimental evidence, then we can say, yes, now we are confirmed that this theory is correct. Till, of course, something comes up which is, creates anomalies, and that's how theories develop even further. So I think Penrose's major achievement was to move beyond what was known. And at that point of time, though the space-time uh, singularity had been predicted, it came out of Einstein's equation. In fact, it happened a few months after 1915, uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity equations. Uh, there was a German uh, officer of, of he was a physicist. He was also an officer in the German army. This is the first world war in progress. And he had, said one of the implications of Einstein's general equations, general theory of relativity equations, was in fact a, a space-time singularity arising out of the equation. And he had given, and that's why it's called the Schwarzfield uh, singularity, all of that name is still is there. And a lot of the, a lot of the name nomenclature of the black hole, in fact, goes back to, to, to his name that he was, he in fact pointed this out. But even Einstein was of the opinion that this is very unlikely, that this would not happen, nature would find ways to not to do it. And one of the arguments that had come up and that it would need the mass to collapse in a symmetric way. And mm -hmm. symmetric collapse of the mass was thought to be something which would not really happen. So maybe this apocalyptic uh, prediction of the singularity, of a space-time singularity would not arise and something else would happen. But what Penrose showed, and that's the major uh, advance that he made, is that he showed that it doesn't need symmetric collapse, that once it had reached a certain stage of collapse and there was a mass of a certain size in a certain space, which is the the density of the space had reached a certain level and there was an amount of mass and he, that equation is really a what mass it is, comes from Schwarzschild's field equation uh, or solution of the general theory of relativity. And that would ensure that even without symmetry, 
the symmetric collapse being there, it would create a black hole. And that was the basic uh, conclusion that Penrose's uh, mathematics shows, or the mathematical strategy he used showed, that it did not need a symmetric collapse, provided it had gone beyond a certain point. In fact, the, this black hole formation would be the, the, the way it would work. What it also showed, and Penrose again has to be credited with that, that it is not only a question of a collapse of a, of a stellar object, but it could happen in a dense region of space. That if there is a certain amount of mass in a given amount of space, then at some point you would get the formation of what he called a trapped surface. And this would lead inevitably to a black hole or a singularity getting formed. So he had generalized uh, this, the equations that he, that were there for the black hole formation and showed that it was, it is more, it is not as specific or it was not as constrained as it was thought earlier. And that's the mathematical contribution he made by which he could actually show all of this. And this led to, as we know, Hawking's taking it up, extending it to Big Bang. The Hawking and Penrose did some work together. They had their singularity theorems. So all of this were really a major advance on general theory of relativity. And I think Penrose and Hawking both have advanced in significant way the general theory of relativity. And one of the consequences, of course, is the basically mathematically showing the existence of singularities would be there. And then are finding now black holes in centers of various galaxies and even outside them. So black holes now have become much more accepted within physics. But when Penrose was working on it, it was still, still thought to be something which is odd, would not really be there. It's very unusual. It's only a physics of speculation, but doesn't really exist in nature. So all these issues were, were there. So I think that is, uh, uh, this is, this is what physics, what makes physics so interesting, that you have an odd mathematical relationship that comes out of certain air, something else, in this case of the general theory of relativity, and that at some point of time advances physics even further. And you talked about how experimental verification is uh, very important for physicists, and that is why it took so long for the theory of Penrose and for the theory of Hawking to be recognized. It was 55 years ago, I think, that uh, Penrose had actually done this paper in 1965 and Hawking of course could not even be recognized because he died two years ago. So can you also tell us more about the experimental part of this work which has been carried out by the teams of Andrea Gez and uh, Ryan Gardgen? You know first is of course Hawking's Big Bang Theory <clears throat> where he extends this whole issue of concept of singularity to say that if we take time backwards, <clears throat> this means there would be a singularity, space-time singularity in time. And this means that the world started with the Big Bang. And he was able to show the cons consistently, I mean, using mathematics, he could show that this was consistent with what we know of physics today. So that was his uh, achievement. But the consequence of that, some experimental verification of the kind we have received for Penrose's conjecture, and Penrose's derivations, uh, that is still not there. So Hawking, even if he had been alive, the Nobel Committee in its wisdom, and we have questions on the wisdom on numerous occasions, and we can discuss that later. The, quest, the issue is that given that, it's unlikely that Hawking would have received the Nobel Prize because they would have said, given the consistency of the performance and the conservative nature of the Nobel Committee, they would have said, we are still awaiting a, a verification. And obviously in physics, a lot of these issues, particularly concerning astrophysics, are going to be difficult because experiments are not possible in astrophysics. You can't really experiment with stars and so on. So all you are really reliant on is nature doing an experiment which you can observe. So I think that's the problem with astrophysics. Anything to do with astrophysics takes really long time to uh, provide verification of this kind. And in the, Einstein himself 
uh, didn't finally receive his Nobel Prize for General Theory of Relativity, even though Eddington had shown that there was, there was experimental basis to believe that there is gravity does bend, for instance, stellar light, light coming from stars, and the gravitational force of the sun could be seen to bend starlight during an eclipse. But even then, the Nobel Committee gave him the Nobel Prize, which they couldn't really stop. He had become a household name for a photoelectric effect. So they didn't give him for general theory of relativity. And they didn't give him a second Nobel Prize either for general theory of relativity, though that's what he's, you know, he's most known for, at least among the lay audience. Coming back to the uh, Gez and Gensel's uh, work on how they plotted this out, this had been already pointed out in the 80s that uh, there seems to be uh, a heavy object at the center of the of this Milky Way galaxy. And uh, this, the black hole problem is that you cannot see it through light. You cannot see it through electromagnetic radiation. So the normal way you observe distant objects is not open to you. So you, the only, uh, only external effect you would feel is that of gravity because it still would have mass. And because it has mass, that attraction of a heavy object, which, is a, which has consumed the mass of, say, uh, many stars or was heavy to start with, then that would be felt in the orbit of nearby uh, stars. So the question was that how do we show conclusively the mass of that object, which if it exists is there in the center of the, of the Milky Way, and uh, what is the size of that mass, and also that there is no other electromagnetic observation we can make of that mass. So that was, that's basically the challenge. And both these teams, and they used two different telescopes, they used different calculations. Both the teams computed one particular star's orbit, which was orbiting close to the center, uh, the Milky Way center, and uh, close in this case, of course, is still pretty large by our standards, but not by uh, stellar standards. So that was the object which one called SO2, the other called S2. This is the nomenclature of the same star. And they tracked it over a period of something like 20, 25 years. And they, I think, started this project in 19, early 1990s and published results over a period of time showing that, that the there is a heavy object, which is why it is moving the way it is. And there are various reasons why you can say it's circling a, a near a very heavy object. Because if you see, for instance, the planets, the closer you are to the sun, the orbit the, is, in fact, the planet moves faster. Its rotational, rotation is faster and a speed is faster. While if you have a more distant planet, it's less. Uh, that's simply because it is uh, the gravitational effect leads to this. So this, this stellar object seems to be moving fast enough for them to consider, consider that this, there was a heavy object uh, at the center, which was causing this trajectory. And both plotted this trajectory, and from that tried to deduce the mass of the object. And both the trajectory and the mass that they calculated, both agree very close to each other. In fact, the uh, citation that is given for the uh, award ha has a detailed paper along with it. This go gives the details of what they saw. And both of them showed very close to each other that this can only be explained if there is a super heavy object of the size of, uh, of the you know, uh, gravitational mass of 4 million solar mass. Sorry, 4 billion solar masses. That is the size that, that would re be required to explain the trajectory. And that's, that's what then confirmed that there is a super heavy object which conforms to what the existence of a black hole. This is Nobel uh, Committee's citation virtually that this is what they say is consistent with that. And therefore, we have experimental proof there is that. But you know, before that, we have had the Event Telescope last year publish a stunning picture of a black hole. And uh, that is 
even much bigger. I think it's 6.5 billion solar masses. So it's a huge gargantum black hole. And uh, that picture is a stunning picture, the first ever picture of a black hole. And that was done to a, a last, last year by what's called the Event Telescope. So uh, that, that, all of this now seems to confirm that yes, Pedro's calculations are right. Black holes are not something which are anomalous. They do exist. And we seem now to be reconciled to the conclusion that in most galaxy centers, there are these massive black holes. Why they are there, how they, are, they have been formed, we leave it to uh, further astrophysicists to uh, talk about. But I think the, the, the broad ground has now been laid out that yes, stellar collapse about, uh, about a certain size, and uh, that's, that was fairly well known, could produce a black hole. Pedro had showed that it would not require very stringent conditions to be satisfied to, satisfy to create that black hole. And now we know that there are possibly other reasons why black holes can be formed. Again, Penrose calculation showed that if you have a certain amount of mass in a certain space, then that beyond uh, a certain mass, it would lead to, the density is achieved of a certain amount, and that's not very high depending on the mass it is, then you could or you would see it collapse into a black hole. So all of these results seem to show that you will see many more black holes most centers of the galaxy seem to have bad black holes. Quasars are supposed to have black holes because it's gravitational collapse, but the gravitational energy being emitted is what seems to be powering the quasars. So all of this is now uh, entering into a new phase where we have taken now for granted black holes exist. They are now even proven according to Nobel Prize Committee and therefore you, you can therefore give the Nobel Prize for that. And we are lucky that Penrose is alive, he's 89. It's because if he had died, then no Nobel Prize can be given. So even if Hawking's uh, Big Bang Theory, and there is again enough experimental evidence of that, uh, which, are, which is there. But if at some point Nobel Committee decides that yes, we have evidence, we can now give a Nobel Prize for it, they can't give it to Stephen Hawking. And because uh, posthumously Nobel Prizes are not awarded. So I, some people have said, well, this is also a hat tip to Hawking, the prize that he did not receive, but he did richly deserve. Because I think he's been the most well-known name in physics after Einstein, at least in our generation. So thank you, Prabhu, for joining us today. And that's all the time we have. Keep watching News Click.